Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to chapter three of the story. All of us have tasted bitter disappointment. I have a picture of that as a little boy. I was out playing and it was hot and I came running into the house. I was so excited to have a huge, tall glass of cold milk. And I poured that milk and was so excited and just started gulping it down only to discover that it was spoiled. <laughs> and you know the terrible feeling of that. Well, life is like that sometimes. What we thought was gonna happen, our dreams come crashing down. We're hurt, we're dis disappointed by people and by things in our life. This was the case with Joseph, the person we're talking about today. You know, Joseph was the 11th child of Jacob and he was raised in sort of a dysfunctional family. Uh, he had a father, Jacob, but he had, he had a mom and then two other stepmoms, but the weird thing is they all lived together. And uh, you know, you've heard the saying, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. I wonder what happens when you have three mamas. It could get really bad. Well, Joseph was a spoiled favorite child. He was the oldest child of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. And his dad gave him this special coat that basically said, you're the top. Uh, by the way, parents, bad idea to, to show favoritism. And Joseph also had kind of a little attitude. You know, he had a dream. And in that dream, his brothers all bowed down to him. And, and he told them that dream. You know, when people hate you and you tell them a dream, you're gonna bow down to me, that doesn't go over really well. And so there was incredible tension and friction in their home. Well, one day, these 10 brothers are out in the field with the herds and daddy sends Joseph, go check on them, really, to go tattle on them. And he goes and finds them in Dothan. When they see him, they decide to kill him. And finally, though, one of the brothers, the nice one says, let's not kill him, let's sell him into slavery. You know, you got a bad situation when your nicest brother wants to throw you into slavery. So they sell him into slavery in Egypt. There he goes and he is sold to Potiphar, who happens to be the chief executioner for, uh, for Pharaoh. You know, the guy with the, with the, the black hood and, and big ax. Not, not a good person to be a slave for. And while he's there, he's faithful in that house, but his Potiphar's wife, has the hots for Joseph. Evidently, he's a very handsome guy, kind of a Ryan Gosling or whatever you might think of a Hollywood movie star. And so she begins to try to seduce him and he continually resists. Finally, one day though, she grabs his rope and he has to just literally run and leave behind the rope. Well, she accuses him of rape. Here he is righteous before God he tells her, how would I do this wicked thing in the sight of God? But she says, me too, when it's not true. And as a result, Joseph is thrown into prison. He's going to spend 13 years unjustly in prison for something that he didn't do. But there are three amazing things you notice about the choices Joseph makes. One he refuses to use disappointment as an excuse for disobedience. You know, here he had his dream shattered, and I've known many people that when they're disappointed like that, especially when it comes to sexual sin, well, that person didn't work out, or, or my husband is so rude, I, I have a right to look somewhere else. I have a right to look online and almost justify that in our life. The same with many other sins, the right to self-pity, the right to, to be angry and sulken. But Joseph refused to let disappointment become an excuse for disobedience. In fact, he dared to believe that incredible truth like we see in Abraham, that when you're walking with God and God has made you a promise, and you run into disappointing circumstances, that is not the end of the story. How many are glad that disappointment is never the end of the story because what God says he started, he's gonna finish. 
And if a promise hasn't come true and everything's going wrong, you know God isn't finished working. And if you will continue to believe, you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so Joseph refused to give in to despair. Moreover, he chose to be aware and pursue the presence of God. One of the phrases you'll see through the whole story is this great phrase that says, and the Lord was with Joseph and he was successful in whatever he did, whether it was in Potiphar's house or the prison. Now what's really cool about that is it doesn't mean that Joseph was just saying, oh yeah, the Lord is with me, the Lord is with me, but it was saying that Joseph chose to be with the Lord. How many know people can kind of passively say, the Lord's with us, but it's different when you say, and I'm with the Lord. I am going to choose to be aware of his presence. That's how he resisted temptation. He didn't say, hey, lady, stay away. Don't you know your husband is an executor? I don't know. You know he said, I could not do this thing against the Lord. He was aware of, of Jesus in his temptation. You know, many people are aware of the Lord when they're at church or in a garden. But here's the true test of our faith. Are you aware of his presence when you're in a dungeon? Are you aware of his presence when you're about to go into the third round of chemotherapy or you find out your son is in prison or your teenage daughter is pregnant? Can you at those times say, wait a second, even if I make my bed in hell, Lord, you're here. And that is where the power comes from to get through these incredibly disappointing times in our life. Joseph made the choice to keep growing. He didn't become passive in prison. He didn't become passive. He, even in Potiphar's house, he rose to the top. He kept using his gifts, his leadership gifts. He used his gift to interpret dreams. And as a result, he was in the right place at the right time. You know, don't just use your gifts when you have your position that you dream of. Oh, when I become the vice president of the company, I'm gonna get organized and be a vision. No, even while you're pushing a broom, because the Bible says when you're faithful with little, God will make you the ruler of very much. Well, the story goes on, and Joseph interprets a dream for one of uh, the prisoners who goes back to Pharaoh, the day comes, Pharaoh has a disturbing dream and can't find anyone to interpret the dream. And though this, this man had forgotten about Joseph, he remembered now, and Joseph is able to interpret this dream for the Pharaoh, that there's gonna be these seven years of bumper crops and plenty, but then that will be followed by seven years of famine and, and, and we need, you need to prepare. And Pharaoh immediately says, well, who could I find to run this operation better than the guy with the vision? And he makes Joseph second in command, deputy chief over all of Egypt. Literally, it took uh, 13 years, but Joseph goes now from the pit <laughs> to the palace because he continued to persevere. Well, during this time, uh, God uses him in an incredible way. And, and it happens just, and he's the only one with a vision, so no, no other nations prepare for this. And because Egypt is prepared, when the famine hits, the nations all start coming for grain and food, including Joseph's brothers. Now, Joseph's brothers had presented, you know, Joseph's coat of many colors torn apart with, with goat blood on it. And Jacob, Joseph's dad, was convinced that he was dead all these years. He had no idea. Joseph's brothers continued to live with the secret. It's, there's no evidence they ever got rid of the shame that they had felt for what they did. But he sends them to Egypt. And through a, a story with a lot of drama, um, they come to Jacob, excuse me, to Joseph, and exactly like the dream had said, they bow before him. It took 22 years from the dream uh, to the destiny. And yet, sure enough, it came to pass. Now, um, Joseph disguises himself, and there's a whole process, like I say, a lot of drama that takes place before Joseph reveals to himself, to his brothers, who he is. One of the things that is so important, and this is sort of at the heart of this story, is that 
Joseph had to take a major journey in his life to forgiveness. If any of you have ever been betrayed or really hurt by your family, you know how deep that wound is. And Joseph had to deal with that. We see that, that incredibly he had already forgiven. He made this incredible choice to not carry the baggage of, of a grudge. So many people, if they had been in Joseph's shoes, they would have, they, that would have been the end. They would have been bitter and hardened and they would have never gone on in God's presence and experienced favor and anointing to fulfill their moment in history. And so Joseph made this incredible decision. Now I am comforted by the fact that when his brothers came back into his life, it wasn't just easy. It wasn't just, oh, I forgive you guys. No, it, it was painful. And let me tell you, forgiveness is often a process. And it often involves grief and, and a whole lot of, a lot of hard choices. And many times the feelings don't just go away. But Joseph made those choices. And he forgives his brothers. Now, there's a couple of things that we'll see. Because of that forgiveness, Jacob and the whole family is brought and live in the land of Goshen. This is a part of a bigger story. The story from the beginning of God making a nation can now be fulfilled because now there's this incubator for Israel to become a nation. All of this happens because of a painful terrible situation that comes into Joseph's life. What I love about this story, and it's kind of the theme, is that at that moment where Joseph thought he was in the worst place when it came to his lower story, the worst place of his life, he was actually, when it comes to the upper story, the very best place he could be. For had he not been in that prison, he would have not been able to interpret that dream. And when, when the story kind of ends, we see a couple of things. We see, one, that God has fulfilled the big story, not only by bringing Israel to Egypt, but by, through the story of Joseph, preaching the gospel, preparing the world for Jesus. You know, we like to say every story in the Bible is about Jesus. And what we see in this story, uh, Joseph, Jesus is the true Joseph. He is the one who had the coat of many colors, who was perfect and righteous, and yet he gave up his coat. He was betrayed and he was unjustly accused. He was sent not just to prison, but he was sent to hell to be condemned for our sins. But there, because of his favor, because he walked with the king, he was raised and exalted and given a throne and a crown. And he rose and took his robe of righteousness in what's so beautiful, he not only forgave us his brothers, he gave us his robe of righteousness. Whereas Joseph's brothers lived in shame, we come to the brother that we all betrayed and he gives us his very righteousness and he restores us. At the very end of the story in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, there is just this incredible thing. Uh, the story ends where, where uh, Jacob is dead now and the brothers think, boy, now Joseph is going to take it out on him. He's going to kill him or something else. And they come up with sort of a lie that says, hey, dad said before he died, don't do anything wrong to us. And Joseph so beautifully responds. Let me read this in Genesis 50, 19 and 20. He says, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. This is such a huge part. How did Joseph find the ability to forgive? How do people find the ability to forgive when they've been devastated? Well, here is a, a huge key. We receive the strength to forgive just like we receive the strength to obey in our lower story by understanding God's bigger story. And God's bigger story is very clearly this, that there is not a person or an event or a thing that can happen to us, that God 
will not use to accomplish his perfect will as long as we stay aligned with his purpose. Romans 8.28 says, For God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. What God says is incredible. He says, if you are in my will, the very worst thing that ever happens to you can become the very thing that God uses to fulfill his greatest and highest purpose. He specializes in turning manure into miracles, in taking even our mistakes and our failures, as well as those sins that others have committed and repurposing and redirecting those things for his perfect will. Charles Colson, who went to prison, he was special counselor to Richard, President Richard Nixon, very famous, and he became convicted in the Watergate scandal and lost everything. He, he said afterwards, though, what was the worst thing that ever happened to me was the thing God used because there he encountered Jesus and became the best thing that ever happened to him because he chose to respond according to God's will. Could you dare to believe that that thing in your life that was your biggest disappointment or that thing that right now is your di biggest disappointment, where people have hurt you the most, where you felt cheated the most, the most injustice in your life happened to you? Could you dare believe that that's part of a bigger story? And that if you will stay aligned with God and make the choices, including to forgive, believing that he's bigger than all that's happened to you, you will see God restore the years the locusts have eaten in your life and allow you to fulfill your greater purpose. In Jesus' name, I believe it's true for you today. God bless you as you discuss his word.